And our last speaker is Mark Schindel, and his research is focused on healthcare um, ergonomics and ubiquitous computing. And he's an engineering professor at the U University of Toronto as well, and is also the founder of the Volcolage Incorporated and author of four books. Okay, so I want to talk about emergency room physicians. I, I, I think it's one of the hardest jobs that's out there, actually. There's so many different things. Probably uh, a military doctor in the American Civil War would be a worse task or a more difficult task, but there aren't many, I suspect. So it's a, it's a very, uh, I would say, stressful uh, task, but it seems like the individuals who do it are, are well suited to the, um, to the job. I wanted to start out talking about the nature of medicine. For someone coming into medicine, it's a bit like maybe somebody going to Japan for the first time. You sort of, you get there and it's like, well, everything's a bit different, and uh, why are things this way? And then if you stay there a few months, it's like, well, okay, I get it. And then you go back to Canada, and it's like, oh, everything's different again. So, you know, maybe different domains have different ways of doing things, and you have to sort of respect the constraints and, uh, properties of each domain. Um, so I, w I wanted to highlight this paper because I thought it was a good one. And it talks about the fact that uh, you know aviation is an engineered system and healthcare really isn't. It's something in the middle. It's got some engineered aspects, but it's also a natural system. And so you know when you try to take things like checklists uh, from aviation and apply them to healthcare, sometimes they work quite well and sometimes they, they don't. Uh, it's, it's a funny thing, right, because uh, you know, aviation is a very mission critical system, <coughs> but overall we don't have many accidents and it's, it's a very safe way to travel. And yet, you know, we, we have these reports of, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of people, you know, getting killed uh, or, you know, through medical error. So, you know, in fact, you know, why is it that, that aviation is such a safe system in a way and, uh, and, and uh, healthcare isn't? And uh, it's not because uh, people are doing better in, in aviation necessarily, it's, it's just a different system with different properties and engineer systems are easier to control. Okay, so, so uh, healthcare is a hard system to control and uh, the emergency room is probably one of the hardest because uh, it's so unpredictable. People come in through the door, you know, and uh, for instance, if you, if you look at Los Angeles hospitals, you know, county uh, USC hospital in uh, central Los Angeles has terrible statistics, right, in, in the ER room. They lose a lot of patients, but if you look at who the patients are, often they have gunshot wounds, so it's not really a fair comparison. So, you know, of, often uh, ERs, you know, face, face very interesting problems because of the locations they're in. So this is just a, a, a diagram I got from that paper I just mentioned by Durso and Drew, and it talks about aviation, and you've got these different levels, the micro level, the meso level, and the, and the macro level, and you have things like crew, crew resource management. And in that situation, uh, what happened was you had this problem with the left seat, the, where the pilot would do stuff, which was everybody could see was wrong, but nobody had the authority to stop them. And the worst example of that was uh, in the Canary Islands in, uh, in the 70s, I think it was, when they had this terrible accident where uh, a plane uh, took off in fog and hit another plane on the runway and about 500 people were killed and that was a case where the pilot just decided he'd lost patience and wanted to go and uh, I think everybody in the, in the cockpit knew it was a wrong idea but didn't have the authority to tell him so after that they, they developed a crew resource management where um, you know the the co-pilot could actually stop the pilot from doing something which was which was obviously wrong um, now the question is could you imagine a surgeon being told uh, okay can you go and wash your hands please you know I don't know if we're quite there yet with uh, with with, with Healthcare, you know, we have that kind of crew resource management, but but that maybe in an engineered system, it's easier to do this kind of stuff. And and certainly physicians, for instance, as far as I can tell, they're not employees of hospitals. I don't understand this stuff very well. But it's very different from a pilot being an employee of an airline and being, uh, you know, much easier to control in terms of uh, making their actions systematic and programmed. <laughs> Okay, so <clears throat> we did a, an ethnographic study with uh, uh, Professor Mike Carter and uh, a couple of my students, and uh, Joe Cafazzo at the Center for eHealth has also done similar work and, and tending to find similar results. So uh, just from the literature, we know that healthcare tends to be non-routine, mobile, <coughs> highly collaborative, uh, context-driven, and so on. So it's, it's a very rich and uh, difficult domain, so it's not surprising that people have troubles with it. Um, one of the things uh, we observed in, in, our, in our study of shadowing physicians, emergency physicians uh, uh, in the hospital, um, was that they have lots of different systems they have to use. There's no single uh, uh, software system. It's very uh, diffuse. And you know, as you probably know, the you know electronic health record is a real problem. And uh, you know, in Canada, we're probably behind. Uh, certainly, uh, Britain and to some extent the U.S. And uh, you know, there's been a whole political football with that. And uh, different hospitals. Tend to have you know different systems. A lot of them rolled their own, or they bought different ones. So it's, it's very hard to integrate, even send, to send data from one hospital to another. They tend to do it by fax sometimes, rather than electronically or digitally. 
So, uh, and, and within hospitals also, there's this lack of integrated systems. There's also this issue of uh, no personalization, so everybody gets the same interface. So we do, even with different roles, they tend to see the same interface, or else they get a completely different system. Um, people tend not to get alerts, and uh, they're, they're working at that. Uh, for instance, in, in Sunnybrook now, I believe they have a project where they're, where they're actually um, creating a, an alerting system. But in the past, you'd have to go and look for the lab test results, whatever that you'd ordered. And if you didn't happen to remember, you know, maybe they'd sit there for a couple of hours and the patient wouldn't be dealt with until you, you, know, you, you figured out where the results were. Um, there's also uh, a problem with collaboration. Um, there, there isn't, uh, people, people tend to find each other and talk and consult with each other, but there's not a, a strong system for, for collaboration. I mean, the best you can do is probably page people, um, and certainly not much in the way of software support. And finally, um, not a lot of user control over the system, so you can't do things like specify when you want to get your alerts and in which order you, know, you want patients uh, uh, or, or, actually, I'm not sure now. <laughs> I'm not going to say this is someone else's slide. I got from my student, um, Aaron. So I don't know. I, 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 I'm not sure how to parse patient ordering. So let me leave that. Not get it wrong. <clears throat> Okay, so one of the areas I'm interested in is clinical decision making. And this is a very complex and, and probably the most important task an emergency physician does. And the question is, well, how can we provide cognitive support um, in a way that uh, allows people to uh, do things naturally in the way that they normally do it? And especially for difficult cases where they're under stress and where there may be you know, severe risk and they have to get it right very quickly. And uh, what, what think people often do and how they're trained in med school is to, to use uh, case-based reasoning. And certainly expert physicians, after a while, they tend to go on a, a, a pattern matching of the properties they see, and then they, they match it against familiar cases, and they decide that you know, it's, it's a match and, and they've got a diagnosis. Um, people out of med school, straight out of med school, they tend to do more um, uh, reasoning from uh, clinical evidence, you know, analytic reasoning. And it's only later on they have enough experience where they can start doing these case-based case reasoning. But obviously, if you have a whole lot of data in the hospital, you know, you know what kinds of um, um, syndromes people have with these these patterns of vital signs and so on you could start to sort of match different cases and say okay well this case here you know has matches these three different <coughs> syndromes you know and you can look at each one of them and inspect them and see how similar they are and and then that that, that helps you having to rely on your memory all the time or even worse trying to trying to reason from first principles which is is, is often a long and hard battle so um, so one idea is to try and, and do kind of data analysis and maybe, you know, um, uh, Dion mentioned uh, data analytics, data mining. You know, maybe there's this, this scope there for doing that kind of work to try and understand what are similar cases to the current one, you know, based on the electronic health record. Um, people at IBM are doing some research on this and they're trying to visualize it and they're doing sort of fancy clustering and so on. But I think uh, part of the problem is just figuring out, you know, the user interface and, and uh, under what conditions people would want to use this and how should the information be presented to them. Uh, I can tell you right now that you know, the, 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 the demo I saw from the IBM folks was really impressive. I couldn't imagine any physician using it, and certainly not in real time when they're trying to make a decision. Uh, a related question is, you know, if you do have high quality clinical evidence, you know, such as you know, these drugs work well in these situations, uh, um, you know, how, how do you make it available? So the, the, the example I remember is, you know, it, you have a 56 year old uh, uh, taxi driver who had a, who's overweight and had a, a male and had a heart attack six hours ago, should you give them uh, thrombolysis or something? And uh, you know, there it may depend on you know, how heavy they are, it may depend on their gender, and, and you may get a different answer depending on on some fairly specific uh, criteria. So it's often, you know, we can imagine that's useful uh, to, to, to push that evidence. And research carried out by Dr. Sharon Strauss and her colleagues, um, including one of my students, Rumi Takeshita, uh, a number of years ago now, did find that if you, you know, had a cart with a computer on it and you dragged it around behind the doctor <laughs> and you gave them the chance to, to, to find the evidence um, and, and it was available to them, it would actually change the decision making about a quarter of the time and it would influence the decision, uh, you know, at least half the time. So. So uh, it's clear that high quality evidence is important, and if you don't have it, the chances are you're going to make you're going to make, make in some cases uh, uh, lesser decisions or less less quality lower quality decisions. So um, in this project, um, we were we were looking at uh, mobile, and uh, I guess. I should have got rid of this slide. I'm going to go right past it. <laughs> I, I was cutting slides to try and fit the 10 minutes. I just found out it was 10 minutes. Okay, so, and I'm probably over already. 
Anyway, how are we going for time? A minute. Okay, if I wasn't talking like this, I would have got through everything. Okay, so let's keep going. Um, this is a project where we, we had the cart, and then we looked at the tablet, and then we had the Blackberries and iPacks, and we were trying to present uh, high-quality evidence from sources like uh, evidence at point of care, e epoch, uh, and uh, Cochrane's reports. There, there are a bunch of these report, um, sources that we looked at, and uh, we, we did a simulation and, and uh, got doctors to try it out and do user testing. I think it worked quite well. So we actually had a report back in industrial engineering uh, magazine uh, uh, a few years ago on that. Okay, uh, another idea is to use more integration and use technology like uh, RFID tags or whatever, so the doctor has a, a very uh, strong uh, ID, and then every, every computer they approach logs them in automatically. I mean, it sounds like a very small thing, but doctors would say it would be wonderful to have, and it would save them just a whole lot of frustration and annoyance. So, you know, these are, these are things. I, I just came back from the National Retail Federation uh, show in New York, which is looking at new technology for retailers, and it's amazing, you know, when you have a profit motive and people are buying goods, you know, the technology is integrating so much better. And somehow with healthcare, it's just, you know, the, we're just way behind. I mean, you see these e-paper uh, uh, technologies where you can have a tag for a price and, you, you know, you have the infrared or whatever in the ceilings and uh, they, can, they can update the price on every, on every uh, tag instantaneously, you know, and, and program that. And th they're probably going to get to a stage where soon the price is going to change. So if it's late at night, you're going to pay more for something than it's, you know, middle of the day, you know. And this kind of technology is, is just so far ahead, I think, of of, of where healthcare is. And not, not as healthcare hasn't, doesn't have this great technology, it's mostly to do with physics, right? You have all the scanning stuff like MRIs and so on. But when it gets down to the, the detailed transactional stuff, it just seems really hard to get technology in there. And you, know, you, you wonder, is there a way to keep socialized medicine and, and, and still get the profit motive there in a, in a beneficial way so that people can try? And I see someone stake shaking their head, but all I, all I can say is, well, I sure wish sometimes the healthcare was a bit more like retail, at least in terms of uh, you know, scanning and, and transactions, because I'd love to see that kind of stuff. Okay, almost finished. <laughs> so I'm going to leave that, except to say that I'm really interested in things like working memory and prospective memory. Uh, often you don't have people remembering the future, okay? So you want to remind them about the past, or you want to tell them what's available now, but you don't have to say, okay, I have to remember to check that lab test. And unfortunately, a lot of healthcare still looks that way. You have a lot of prospective memory. You have a lot of things being held in the doctor's personal working memory instead of in the system somewhere, ready when they need it. Okay. Um, Last one I'm going to show you very quickly is uh, we did some work on context awareness with alerts. And uh, this was a screen we came up with. And it turns out that you may think you're really you know, a human factors expert and you've got lots of good ideas, but you have to do user testing all the time. This is something you also do at uh, Global eHealth a lot. And um, so here's an example where we tried to sort of come up with these uh, lab, lab test updates. And you have here the ones that have already been looked at, and the colored ones are the ones that haven't been looked at. And you have for different people, and it's a nice overview. And we thought, well, this would be good, because you can see all the information at once. But they, the, the physicians didn't like it. Uh, they, they had these complaints. They found it confusing. Um, they wanted to see things organized organized by type of test. They really want to see it organized by patient. And so they wanted something to see much more like that, which was a bit more familiar to them. And you know, sometimes you, 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 want, you, you wonder whether they're really just used to stuff, and if you gave them new stuff, they'd learn it, or whether it really is better you know, the way it was, and you, you want to sort of keep it, keep it in the paper format in a way. So there's a bit of a tension there, but, but certainly user testing is uh, obviously very important, and, and you get very different results from what you might think. Okay, the final thing here, and you probably can't see it, but I was a bit fuzzy because I blew it up from a PDF. But you know, this idea that we need to um, uh, look at, you know, uh, just the end here, the realistic context. Where is it? Um, um, I can't find it anymore. Somehow, when I turn over there, I can see it here. Realistic context that uh, acknowledge the variety of uh, stakeholders and uh, produce results that are assessed and evaluated against a long-term global perspective. And I think we're missing this uh, global perspective. And uh, it, you know, we're in silos at the moment, right? So we have the math models, we have the human factors, and I think we're all trying to work towards a, a better system. But, but there's just so many problems. It's kind of like whack-a-mole. You know, which one do you start at first? <laughs> okay. Thank you very much.